Donald Trump underperforms in the South Carolina primaries and Fox and the GOP is in panic mode. Also, Donald Trump gave a speech at CPAC where he bragged about being the best rambler of all time. And that followed a speech at something referred to as the Black Conservative Federation Gala in South Carolina, where he said that he has been indicted for black people. Also, Donald Trump's campaign, I guess, with tactics like that, it's not shocking that they are short on money. Also, deeper systemic issues seem to be taking place behind the scenes with donors not recognizing their money's going on a recurring basis. Also, the RNC is suffering massively as well with uh, the ability to raise funds. This as Donald Trump is about ready to install his daughter-in-law, Lara, as the co-chair of the RNC, and she's promised to divert all of the RNC money directly to Donald Trump. That one <laughs> quote from Lindsey Graham from uh, several mm -hmm. years back seems to be right when Lindsey Graham actually told the truth that if you elected Donald Trump, it would destroy the Republican Party. Donald Trump filed a notice of appeal in the New York Attorney General civil fraud case, but with no bond at mm. all. What's up, Alina Habba? I thought you said that he was going to post the bond and that he had the money. This means that interest continues to stack up each day, about $111,000 every day. There's that debt counter as well that we'll share with you uh, during the show. Also, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg filed a number of pretrial motions in the criminal case set for trial on March 25th, 2024. There's nothing Donald Trump can do. He can't stop this from happening. One of those pretrial motions includes a limited gag order that looks a lot like the gag order that was upheld by the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals in the Washington, D.C. federal criminal case against Donald Trump. So great work, Donald Trump. You've created a whole body of case law about how they deal with maniacs like you and also some strong economic news that I am happy to report, although a, a lot still needs to be done. But this is happening at the same time that Republicans in the House of Representatives are leading us to a shutdown after taking a two week vacation and they just continue to gaslight each and every day. Folks, this is the Midas Touch podcast. I'm Ben Micellis, joined by Brett and Jordy Brothers. How's it going on this Monday? It's going great. It's great to be here, brothers, as always. Great to be here with the Midas Mighty. You know, one of the things that I enjoy about the fact that the Republican Party has reimagined itself in the image of Donald Trump is that they didn't just take pieces of it. So yeah, you have some of the lawmakers like dying their skin orange. That's weird. You have the weirdos <laughs> like Marjorie Taylor Greene acting like Trump, like that's weird. But they went all the way to like the bankruptcy part of it. And, and I truly appreciate that. It's it, it seems like kismet that almost at the same time you see these Republican parties throughout the country and the National Republican Party and Donald Trump essentially heading towards bankruptcy. Coincidence? I think not. Jordy, how's dad life going, man? You must you must be tired. You're getting sleep. What's what's new? Dad life is going great. And you just reminded me about uh, just like this Republican Party and themselves just like taking all of the worst traits of Donald Trump. And it also reminded me about their right wing. Just well, what, are the, what are the good ones? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point. I, I guess he's tall. You I, I can't not give him that. I guess I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> remember when Sean Hannity interviewed him and he like dyed his skin orange to like meet the weird orangeness yeah, effect so. of his dear leader? It's, it's bizarre. Weird. Just absolutely bizarre. I'm super excited. The Alina Hava stuff, Ben, is is funny because there was that famous line she had said where she said, "Is you know, it's easier to fake being smart than being good looking. And, and time and time again, that just proves just not true for her. And it's going to be interesting to see how these things continue to play out. I mean, look, the very fact that she even makes a statement like that, like these are serious <laughs> Like these are serious cases to handle, right? Like, you know, when I went to Georgetown Law, like I took this all very, very serious. And, you know, after I graduated, you know, I I tried to handle, you know, these cases with the utmost diligence and, and care. And it can never, ever just like 
comport with anything. I know that on a big case like this, you're going on these podcasts and saying, you know, I'd so much rather be hot than smart. But like that just goes to show you what what MAGA has become. And if you have a lawyer like that, even if you have an opportunity to win, you're going to lose and you're going to make all of the wrong decisions to compound your damages and make things even worse than they could otherwise could be. I mean, like, take a look at this, like Joe Takapina for all of his flaws, he managed to keep those damages in the first E. Jean Carroll case to about $5 million. Think about that. Sure. Right. I mean, think about is, that. Is, is it weird that now I'm like, oh, that's all, <laughs> you know, with the, with the not Donald Trump numbers that we see now, you're like, oh, 5 million, that's it. Yeah, I mean, Joe Takapina is a skilled trial lawyer that was repeated by the judge, by E. Jean Carroll's lawyers, and he took a lot of positions that were certainly very, 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 you know, sadistic, and I think that he was fighting himself also and having to make these arguments <laughs> when in, and you kind of saw that, you know, in his kind of physical deterioration as well, <laughs> you know, during it. But he kept the damages to five million dollars. You look at the Alina Habba specialty, it's eighty three point three million dollars. And now when you add prejudgment and postjudgment interest in New York, it's like getting close to four hundred and seventy million dollars. And that's just going to increase every day where they don't they didn't post the bond. With the notice of appeal, they had like 30 days to file the notice of appeal. Why would you file the notice of appeal without the bond? I mean, technically, you can appeal the case without filing or posting the bond, but it makes no sense to do that because if your adversary who holds the judgment, if the party that now holds the judgment, in this case, the New York Attorney General's office, moves to enforce the judgment and that stay expires um, uh, 30 days after the judgment was entered. And I believe Ngoron officially entered the judgment. I believe it was February 22nd when the written judgment was entered. So if you appeal it, it takes two or three years to appeal. By that time, New York Attorney General Letitia James will have seized all the money from Trump's accounts and she would have sold all of the buildings. So let's just say even if Trump were to basically win, he'd still lose if he's not going to post the bond because the judgment's going to be kind of fully enforced and it could moot a major part of that. So there are some people wondering, well, he can still file the appeal? Sure, but, but New York Attorney General Letitia James can enforce and start selling his properties and it also just goes to show you that Donald Trump doesn't have the money. That's why it's really an odd and weird thing to file a notice of appeal if you don't have the bond because the other side will just enforce the judgment. So I just want to address that piece. Um, you know, at at, at the it's top. It's such right an here. interesting thing, and and it's also you know it, it's what also makes Donald Trump dangerous as a political candidate because this is a man who is desperate for money and is not even able to go to the banks in New York, any bank associated with New York to get it. He has people who are unwilling to give him money because of his history. And so he's got to find these unsavory sources, so to speak, mm -hmm. if he even wants to get the money. So in that case, what do you do? You got to, I guess, find a multi-billionaire who's willing to part with their money for you. Or alternatively, you got to look to the same places that Trump and his family have historically looked, which is Saudi Arabia and countries like that who could have direct influence over Donald Trump and his decision making. So I think this is really interesting that he has not submitted his bond. I thought it was interesting as well that the names on this a notice of appeal were Cliff Robert and Alina Haba and not more seasoned appellate lawyers in the case here. And I just you got to think like if, if you got a parking ticket and Alina Haba was your lawyer, I think you'd walk out of that court getting convicted of murder. Somehow that is how <laughs> Alina Habba has handled this cases and for her to be doing this appeal. It just then makes no sense to me. So Brett, I, I, I like the point where, where you say that, you know, you have to go to these unsavory characters. Donald Trump does because banks won't loan him money. But I think also a, a part of what he's doing in the court system. And Ben, please check me on, on this is like, he almost at this point likes the idea that he's in court so much that, that he continues to pop up in these court arguments because he could then point to not just these unsavory billionaires, Brett, 
but then to these honestly the these suckers these donors of his who are willing to spend their social security money to give the guy you know five dollars here ten dollars here that adds up to millions and millions of dollars because he could say look they're prosecuting me politically for staying in the courts this is what they're doing to me so brett exactly to your point you know he's trying to figure out new ways to get the money and there are scary ways like the ones that you mentioned but then there are also the grifting ways which we've seen them play out sure but you know what that money though is drying up jordy that well is drying up and we're seeing it on the campaign finance reports that donald trump's campaign is now spending much more money than they are taking in and the campaign is collecting just far less money in this year than they were during the previous election years. And so you're seeing that donors are not as willing to give the money to Donald Trump, by the way, or the Republican Party, because they know that all their dollars are basically going to Alina Haba or to pay these judgments or whatever they're doing. I mean, there has been a 62 and a half percent drop, Jordy. 62.5% drop in small dollar donations Ooh. based on November, November 2022 through the end of last year compared to the year before the 2020 election. Those are That's a staggering drop off for small dollar donations. And this chasm between the amount of money that you see Joe Biden and the DNC having, the war chest that the Democrats have right now going into this presidential location. I mean, Biden's reelection team has more than $130 million in the bank, in the bank. The RNC has practically none practically nothing. So this is to me almost one of the most untold stories of the election as well. This money advantage of the Biden campaign versus Trump, who is just sputtering along with the Republican Party out of control. And think about where things are headed also, right? Like this is where President Biden starts to ramp up, right? And so the numbers that you just discussed, Brett, are like what it's like on the runway, right? The plane hasn't even taken off, you know, whereas not only has Donald Trump, you know, is, is parked on the ground, but it's basically a crash landing right now and is not looking good. One point I want to make as well is, you know, the same way that Donald Trump is handling these cases, though, is how he's handled businesses. And it's also how he leads or I should say doesn't lead. And you take anything. But let's talk about COVID. What does Donald Trump say? Like a miracle, it is all going to go away, right? The fact that a statement like that is not disqualifying, like when you need a leader to come up with a plan and their plan is like a miracle, this is not going to hit our shores. It will all go away. Don't even worry about it, right? That's how he runs things. He ignores the problems or worse, he makes the problems worse. And then all of a sudden, everywhere, all at once, it hits with a catastrophic nuclear-like outcome. That's what makes him so dangerous. That's why you go back through his careers, starting with the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. This man is not a builder. He's a perennial destroyer. Everything he's touched he has basically destroyed and bankrupted one thing after another. So it's fairly, and why? Because we see him. This, this man is unwell. He's always been unwell. He's particularly unwell right now. He doesn't have the temperament. He's pathologically incapable of doing actual functions. And, you know, he has this power, I guess, to kind of create this cult-like following in various things and to somehow mesmerize the media into ignoring actual data points. And that's happened, you know, even when he launched like the Trump Taj Mahal. You go back and you watch some of the stuff the media is like, the billionaire Donald Trump is creating a magnificent, they're calling it the eighth wonder of the world, bankrupt 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 so he has a it's a so whole true. track record and a whole history of that and, and that's what we're going to break down more about in this episode but let's talk about south carolina brett and jordy which is again trump has underperformed in the polls in each of the first three primary contests right where we actually get data 
The data shows the polls are not just wrong, but usually like very wrong. But they all tell the almost exact same story when we actually get the data from the primaries, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina. So take South Carolina, for example. It's very similar to what we saw in Iowa and New Hampshire. Trump receives under 60 percent of the vote. Nikki Haley gets about 39.5% of the vote. Polling said that Trump would win by about 30%, which was not the case. So 40% of Republicans did not vote for Trump, and 60% of Nikki Haley voters said that they would not vote for Trump in a general election. And it should also be reminded that President Biden received 96% of the vote in South Carolina. And there, I didn't hear the media say, President Biden did. President Biden trounced it. President Biden dominated South. That's actually a domination. Six, 96%, you could use the words crush and trounced and dominated. Yet, Brett and Jordy, did you see Kristen Welker on Meet the Press? You know, her very yeah, first thing she, she did was... Sure was a softball interview with Donald Trump and I swear I thought this was parody I was shocked that this was that this was real but this is what she said on Meet the Press over the weekend about results where the were just the data if you look at it Trump underperformed significantly here play this clip Trump delivering a crushing blow to Haley in her home state on Saturday trouncing her by nearly 20 points with nearly 60% of the vote The former president dominating nearly every key group in the South Carolina Republican primary electorate, according to NBC News exit poll results. Trump now setting his sights squarely on the general election. What was that? I mean, that (laughs) last face as she's she's saying it. Dominate. Like who even says the word dominated? Like like who even uses that inflection? She's so expert. The scariest part about this, too, is like if you really don't follow day-to-day politics. And this is the one show per week that you watch. I mean, we say this a bunch on the show, but like this is a prime example of that. You would think this guy's a normal guy. You would really think that Donald Trump's messaging is resonating with the larger American audience, with the larger typical conservative audience, if you want to use that word. But it is just disheartening to see this from a major legacy media station. They meet the press always gets to be like, okay, how can we one up ourselves here? Right. We had Chuck Todd. Nobody. I miss Chuck Todd. Chuck Todd. I miss right Chuck Todd. I said, I miss Chuck, Chuck Todd. Chuck Todd was your public enemy number one, Jay. And now we get Chris. Todd, Todd. Like, no reason. I, I want to just blanket apologize to Chuck Todd if he's watching. I know why. <laughs> I don't think we need now. I don't think we need to go that far. But you can even see it kind of like the way she says it. She is like salivating at that saying, Trump dominated and just you wait what's going to happen it, it's as if she is a trump campaign official delivering this news which just doesn't even line up with the facts but the interesting thing that i found was when you looked at these right wing media sources they, they were the ones who actually <laughs> reported what happened correctly like it it was like i was in the twilight zone watching this i go to the drudge report which is typically a more right leaning site and this was the headline on Drudge Report, 40% Republicans vote against Trump in South Carolina. Demographic warning signs. And then as you go into the subtitles on the top, they even go into his other blunders. More worrying blunders. Go vote November 27th, Trump said. He says he wants Biden as president. Like they go through just all of the various things about Donald Trump and and his recent errors. And then you go from Drudge Report, you go to Fox, and then you see people on Fox even positioning it more correctly, speaking about the difference between Biden's performance in South Carolina and Donald Trump's performance in South Carolina. I'll play you one clip of that right now. Party. So if you think about this, this is a unique election in the sense that we have basically two incumbents. You have Joe Biden, who's running for a second term, and Donald Trump who's running for a second term, right? And so how did Joe Biden do in South Carolina? 96.2% of the vote. Donald Trump got 60% and four in 10 voters in the Republican Party said no. Even though they know that the race is pretty much over, that he's going to be the nominee, they still voted against him. Um, that That is a problem because when he says this is the most united Republican Party he's ever mm. seen, it is not the most united Republican Party. And 59% of those Haley voters say they're not voting for him. That That is... 
it feels like you have a lot of these Republican insiders who have their internal polling and see what's going on and see the damage that Donald Trump did to their voters. And they are panicking and they are trying to sound the alarm the same way Nikki Haley is sounding the alarm. And I'll show you Nikki Haley's comments that she made on Fox. If people don't look at what is happening, Donald Trump can't win a general election. The RNC is broke. He has spent $60 million of his own campaign contributions on legal fees. Now he's going to start draining it out of the RNC. Well, I'm, I'm sure Lara Trump will solve all of those problems where she uh, does, quote, putting every single penny into Donald Trump's pockets. But that wasn't all. Like Fox kept hitting this home, actually, kind of nonstop this weekend. Even Fox's John Roberts sounding the alarm here. The real key here is this 59% of Haley voters who say that they would not vote for Donald Trump should he become the nominee. That tracks with about 24% of the Republican Party, which is right along the lines of what that New York Times Siena poll showed us a year ago, almost a year ago now, in terms of the makeup of the Republican Party, in which there was about 25% of Republicans who say that they are never Trumpers. And those numbers just aren't going to get better for Donald Trump. Then there was this interesting exchange between Brett Baer and Trey Gowdy. For those of you who may not remember Trey Gowdy, Trey Gowdy was basically James Comer before James Comer. He was one of the most obnoxious right-wing sort of fake investigator sort of guys. And here's what Trey Gowdy had to say about Donald Trump's chances on Fox. In terms of unity, though, Brett, I, I mean, has he looked at the House of Representatives lately? Has he looked at the GOP Senate? I don't see a unified party. I see a party where over half of her supporters right now would not vote for him. By the way, James Comer makes Trey Gowdy look like a brilliant statesman. <laughs> totally. I mean, right? Like, G Gowdy was horrific, but still 20 times better than James Comer, which is which is saying a lot. And Brett, every time it's... I look at Trey Gowdy, I just need to say it because every time it, it just <laughs> MAGA Mr. Mackey from from South Park, you, like he like he he, he <laughs> talks and sounds and kind of even looks like Mr. Mackey from South Park. <laughs> he does. <laughs> and, 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 and look, while it's anecdotal. We've been talking now, what, for about two years and sharing these stories. Now there's probably about Oh, no, tens of thousands of stories of people sharing with us who were who are mainstream Republicans or former Republicans or independents who would vote Republican or Democrat, who watch the Midas Touch Network very frequently, who, who have been sharing with us their stories about them, their family members, people they know, neighbors, coworkers, who have all been saying something very consistently there where, where we were like, Whoa, this is a massive trend. I mean, if we're getting tens of thousands of messages of people who are voluntarily sharing these stories with us, is there something deeper going on in this country? Is there this Republican MAGA shrinkage taking place? And is the dynamic of this election something that nobody else is really talking about, that this is not a Democrat v. Republican election? that this is not a liberal v. conservative election, that this is a pro-democracy, pro-normalcy election versus a MAGA wannabe authoritarianism and frankly, odd and weird, you know, you know, dynamic. So is, is that what's really taking place here? So are the very framework within which the media is operating distorting everything they do from the way they're polling, the way they're talking about issues by viewing things through a traditional prism of the way Obama v. Romney, Obama v. McCain, right? John Kerry v. George W. Bush. That just ain't the dynamic that is going on. But then that anecdotal data that we've been talking about has been reflected not in one, not in two, not in three. Every single special election, every single primary, the red wave that never took place, every referendum vote, the data comes back consistent 
and then yet the media ignores the actual voting data that's taking place. And all we're saying here is, hello, hello, can you look <laughs> at the data? So when you see Kristen Welker say domination and that it's because she's going by a script of a horse race and she's not actually reading the script that mm. is reflective of the data that's staring us in the eyes. There's a lot we're going to talk about on the show, but I want to tease it by reading what uh, at Black Knight 10K, he always changes the screen name also. This, right now it's I smoked $364 million of Trump. <laughs> Derek Knight, just a great podcast, by the way, called He's a Part of the Insurrection Podcast. And here's what he said. Star. He goes, there are currently six major, major election shaping stories playing out right now. One. A Russian asset who is the GOP star witness in impeachment is in pre-trial detention. That's referring to, of course, Alexander Smirnov, the key witness who was working for Russia to take down President Biden, who's admitted to it. Two, Ken Chesborough detailed in writing that the fake electors were part of a coup. This is Donald Trump's lawyer, co-defendant, somebody who pled guilty already in the Fulton County District Attorney case, someone who's apparently now lying in the Michigan criminal investigation as well. He had alt accounts that he was basically talking about the coup. So that's out there. Three, Trump can't pay his New York fraud trial or defamation trial judgments and will likely have his property seized. Four, Trump's political action committee could be hit with criminal charges in Wisconsin, which could kill his 2024 fundraising. A bipartisan ethics commission in Wisconsin found that Trump's PAC Save America was money laundering to the opponent of Robin Voss, the speaker of the assembly, who wouldn't overthrow the results of the 2020 election for Donald Trump when Trump was trying to get him to do it in 2022. Also, the GOP is broke and going into an election year. Laura Trump's going to steal the rest of their pennies. Trump's criminal trial in New York begins in less than a month. And then, um, and then this post says, I don't understand how there's not wall-to-wall -wall Hillary's email level news coverage. But here's the great thing. And this is what I think is an important point for Derek and for all of us is that yeah, is the media going to report on that at this point? They've showed us who they are, right? We know what they're going to do. They want to horse race it. They want to both sides it. But that's where independent media has taken its place, right? You know, the void that they created is going to be filled. And you watching this, you listening to this, you're the ones filling it. You've created a community to say, we don't need you. NBC, we don't need you other, other things to be the gatekeepers. Don't gatekeep accurate data. Let's hear it. And we're going to be the ones sharing it. So that to me is actually the response that's being created in 2024 by you watching and you listening to this. We've got a lot more show. I do want to tell everybody we're on our way to 15,000 patrons. Let's go. 15,000 patrons. We're right there. We may just be hitting it while the show's even taking place. But to celebrate that 15,000, we're going to do a special after show as well. But make sure you all hit uh, subscribe. Uh, go to patreon.com slash Midas Touch. Check it out. Let's get that number to 20K. Let's get that number to 25K. Keep Let's grow in. Owen, and we'll be right back after our first quick break of the show. Midas Touch is brought to you by bookshop.org. You may be watching or listening to our show right now, but are you reading enough? It's time to dive back into books and conquer that reading goal you set for yourself this year with bookshop.org. There are so many great books out right now that help you make sense of this moment. Or maybe you just want to get away from the political noise and unwind with a good novel. Bookshop.org has just the book you're looking for. Bookshop.org is unapologetically anti-Amazon. Why? Because when you purchase from bookshop.org, you're supporting local independent bookstores so they'll be around for all of us to enjoy in the future. They're committed to helping independent bookstores not just survive, but thrive and continue to foster culture, curiosity, and a love of reading in your community. Bookshop.org has raised over $30 million from local bookstores. You can even pick which bookstore you want to support, whether it's your local bookstore or your hometown favorite. Bookshop.org is truly for everyone who loves to read and knows the power of a good book. 
I just finished reading The Attributes, 25 Hidden Drivers of Optimal Performance by Rich Devinney, and I cannot recommend it enough. This is one of bookshop.org's bestsellers, and after reading through it, I totally understand why. Start feeling good about where you buy books. Use code MIDAS to get 10% off your next order at bookshop.org. That's code MIDAS, M-E-I-D-A-S, to get 10% off at bookshop.org. Heart health and staying healthy, especially when you have family, friends, or loved ones that you want to be able to spend as much time with as possible. It's so important. February is Heart Health Month in the United States, and more than half the population would still benefit from blood pressure support. Super Beats Heart Chews are the number one doctor, pharmacist, and cardiologist recommended way to support healthy blood pressure, and they even promote heart healthy energy without the stimulants. Paired with a healthy lifestyle, the antioxidants in Super Beats are clinically shown to be nearly two times more effective at promoting normal blood pressure than a healthy lifestyle alone. And with over 40,000 five-star reviews and counting, people are raving about Super Beats Heart Chews. Super Beats Heart Chews are absolutely delicious and are truly much better than any alternative supplements out there. I take my Super Beats Heart Chews each morning and it's really helped kickstart my day. After taking my Super Beats Heart Chews, I feel like I have more energy, and I'm ready to take on the day. Super Beats is the number one doctor, pharmacist, and cardiologist recommended heart chew for cardiovascular health support. It's blood pressure support you can trust. Support your heart health with Super Beats Heart Chews. Get a free month supply of Super Beats Heart Chews on all bundles and a free full-size bag of turmeric chews valued at $25 with your order by going to MidasBeats.com. We've got our own domain name folks. It's M-E-I-D-A-S-B-E-E-T-S dot com. Get this exclusive offer now only at MidasBeats.com. We are back here on the Midas Touch podcast. Jordy. Hold up. I, hold, I know. I know that's everyone's favorite part of the show, but I freaking love these two sponsors. The Super Beats Hard Shoes are incredible. Bookshop.org. That is a brand new sponsor for the Midas Touch Network. Definitely check them out. Brett just crushed that read. Crushed Cameron out a great discount for y'all. Get, get whatever book you want on there. It is awesome. I love that they say they're unapologetically anti-Amazon. I think that's a kind of a funny line that they want us to throw in there. But but check that out. It's, <laughs> it helps the show. <laughs> the, the, the books are incredible. And who doesn't love to read? We all love to read. The links are right in the description of this YouTube. Use the code MIDAS. They're also in the description of the audio podcast themselves. Brett, one of the things I do is after Trump gives these traveling fascist circus events that he calls rallies, I, I often post on one of the social media platforms a list of things that he said. And, and I literally just quote it. I'll say, basically, he said the following things. And when you, there's something about seeing him in writing that it's like, whoa, no, no way. And then I always give the supporting video and evidence that I was like, I was like, yeah, that's actually things that, that he said. And, and they border on the dangerous, the racist, not border, they are racist, hateful, deranged, weird, you know, and then I think back to that one statement that Donald Trump made in the 2020 debates about the Proud Boys stand back and stand by and how people were like, whoa, what'd he say? Stand back and stand by. And I was like, right now he's saying things that are a thousand times worse than that. I mean, every time he gives a speech, he comes out to a J6 anthem. He comes out with an anthem that is a manipulation of the national anthem which is a song he created with the J6 uh, attackers. And he says that this is such an important song and it gets more views than Taylor Swift. It, the whole thing is strange. Let's just take a quick look at just the past weekend of the types of things that he said. And first, let's start by uh, an event that Trump gave. It was, it was at a, a group called the Black Conservative Federation Gala in South Carolina. And our editor-in-chief, Ron Filipkowski, actually got some video footage also that we posted, you know, that really shows that it just seemed like there was a lot of mostly white people there from at least <laughs> the, 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 video, the video that that, that I saw there. Um, and it's just kind of the thing where like Donald Trump goes to a non-union shop and then says he's at a union shop and kind of stages these things, stuff that we're used to seeing people like 
Kim Jong-un and Vladimir Putin do stuff like this. But at this event in South Carolina, here Donald Trump is speaking on a Black Conservative Federation gala. And let's just play the first clip of what he says, Brett. And then I got indicted a second time and a third time and a fourth time. And a lot of people said that that's why the black people like me, because they have been hurt so badly and discriminated against. And they actually viewed me as I'm being discriminated against. It's, it's been pretty amazing. Well, in addition to just the hateful and racist statement that he just made, the way he's even saying it is like a crazy person. I like I get what he said is so racist and crazy. So let me just call it out right there. Um, the, the idea that black people relate to him because he got indicted, I mean, it's such a heinous thing to say. So, so stipulated. But then he even goes like, as I got indicted the first time and the second time and the third time, uh, you know, and like, I'm like watching that and I'm like, I'm just like, what, what in the world, you know, what even world is that? It's quite amazing. It's quite amazing. Like, I, again, I, I, it's truly like watching somebody who's got real serious issues who, you know, uh, you know, my, my parents warned me that if you saw someone like that sitting at a bar, just to kind of, you know, politely ignore them, you know, and, and not go anywhere near them. And, and like, that's what he does here. He talks about how the lights were so bright that it, uh, I don't even want to say it. It's just so weird and disgusting. Here, play this clip. These lights are so bright in my eyes that I can't see too many people out there. But uh, I can only see the black ones. I can't see any white ones, you see? That's how far I've come. That's how far I've come. That's a long, that's a long way, isn't it? We've all seen the mugshot. And you know who embraced it more than anybody else? The black population. It's incredible. You see black people walking around with my mugshot. You know, they do shirts and they sell them for $19 a piece. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't even know what to, like, the, the important thing to recognize is that that's not normal. That's not political discourse, right? Like, that's not conservative, Jordy. That's not that's not normal behavior. And this isn't just like, oh, you got Democrats and then you've got conservatives. That is unhinged, racist, and also just very, very weird. So then Trump goes to CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Committee, and this is their annual conference and convention that they that they hold. And CPAC used to be like a very well attended. Every day was like sold out. They had real speakers talk about actually conservative issues, and they would have like, you know, the top conservative thinkers of their day talk about things. Now they had like J6 pinball, you know, like woke tears, water bottles, you know, you had the most, you know, like you had um, uh, Christy Nome, Governor Nome, one of the MAGA saying, you know, you guys suck, Democrats, like you all suck. And then you'd have like Steve Bannon go up there and go, and here's what I say to all of you, suck it. You know, and I, it's like, I'm like, what, what in the world am I, wa what, what am I watching here? It's like a wrestling, a weird wrestling. It's like, event. yeah, it's, it's again, that's why it's like, look, it is cosplay fascist WWE. Like if you want to make a dystopian movie, like do it, but like, can you not make decisions and have this become a political party that like makes decisions over like life and death and over like our lives, like, please no. So here Donald Trump calls himself at CPAC during his speech. He calls himself a political dissident. Play this clip. I stand before you today, not only as your past and hopefully future president, but as a proud political dissident. I am a dissident. Here he calls the J6 insurrectionist hostages. Play the clip. You heard the J6 hostages, didn't you? You heard that. And uh, I will tell you, there's never been in the history of our country a group of people treated the way they've been treated. There's never been anything like it. Again, he obviously, when he spoke in front of the Black Conservative Federation Gala, um, doesn't necessarily know his American history at all, number one. Um, number, number two, he's saying that the January 6th attackers are hostages and they've been treated unfairly. He's also talking there, just so you know what he's even, he's talking about, you heard them. 
that's the song that he plays where he's manipulated the national anthem to be a song by the insurrectionists. And do you remember the outrage from all these right wing people on Twitter and on Fox during the Super Bowl when they played Lift Every Voice and Sing, which has become known as the yes. black national anthem before Such they played point. the actual national anthem. They go, how dare they play a song that some people refer to as the black national anthem? Not only does Donald Trump not play the actual national anthem, he plays the January 6th national anthem. Just Let's just put it in perspective to how sick that this is. He's stripped away the national anthem. It's like a core tenant of fascism right here. And in place of the national anthem, he has the January 6th prison anthem. Like, I, I still don't think a lot of people realize that this is what happens at every Donald Trump event. And that's why I think as people see this mm -hmm. for the first time, I think they're like, holy crap. I mean, and he spends a lot of time talking about... Uh, not having cognitive issues. I mean, he spent a significant portion of the speech real, like, like what was the thing he said most, if you were to do like the word tree, not cognitively impaired, probably would come up the most on the things that he actually talked about at CPAC. So here he talks about how his rambling stories are not a sign of cognitive problems. Play this clip. These fakers up there, he rambled on endlessly telling these horrible and very boring stories. No, they're very informative stories. They're very important stories, actually. But no, that's, uh, there's no cognitive problem. If there was, I'd know about it, in fact. Okay, you would know about it. So Trump again says his rambling is not a sign of cognitive issues. Play this clip. See, they'll say he rambled. He's cognitively impaired. No. It's really the opposite. It's total genius. You know that. It is. It's total genius. It's total genius. It's total genius. I mean, again, like I legitimately watching an actual crazy person. And again, this is not hyperbolic. It's not like, oh, you hate Trump and blah, 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 blah. Look, if anybody was like that and was running for a major office, that's what i would be focusing on or, 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 or a minor office <laughs> or, 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 or a minor no it's just a great point brett or, or anything any, setting aside anything that. anything i always say if someone behaved like this at a large corporation medium size small corporation nonprofit, your fantasy football league your card club you know you know your bird watching group and someone acted like that i mean what if you had someone show up and they were like here he is again, bragging about rambling. Like, what if someone like showed up? Let's say the crew that you go bicycling with, right? Um, I, I, I often there's a lot of there's a lot of bikers by, uh, by bicyclists by where I live, and a lot of them watch Midas Touch. So sometimes I'll be walking and getting coffee, and some of them will stop me and say, "You know, we watched the show. We watched it." I was on the phone with you when that someone happened. Someone in your bicyclist club went and and said this while they were like riding with you. Play this clip. They'll say. He rambled. Nobody can ramble like this. Nobody. If they did, they'd be, they, they wouldn't even try. You know what? They go step by step and they would never get off that sucker. They go step by step. And you'd be like, whoa, like there's not, like not well, like not, not okay. So j just so the cyclists out there don't come for you. I don't think they're called bicycling groups. I, I think they're cyclists. So just th that. But yes, to your point, Ben, what I've seen Trump do time <laughs> and time and time again, and honestly, it's just because we watched so many of these clips and you could really start to dissect just the just the, the wackiness in the brain there is he's projecting so much about his own cognitive decline that he's got to emphasize how all with it he he is, right? Like that's what we see him do time and time again now. When a few weeks back, he was talking about when, when there was news about his health, when there were photos of, of his hands not looking so good or, or him not looking so great that hit the publications, who did he point to? He pointed to Jimmy Carter in the hospice. He said, oh, Jim, that Jimmy Carter's not doing so well. And then what does he do when the Melania stuff starts to heat up? Like, where's Melania? He points to Nikki Haley's husband. Where? I haven't seen Nikki Haley's husband. Meanwhile, that guy's where? He's, fight, he's overseas. He's serving. So time and time again, now just, doth protest too now, much, now as, they protest say, too much as they say, Brett. Here, by the way, is what, uh, speaking of projection, here's Donald Trump says that uh, the suburban women 
who hate him actually love him. And and by the way, I'm sure the best way to you know win support is to is to tell suburban women that that they should love him. I'm sure that's going to work here. Play this clip. And by the way, I just want to mention, if you remember, he tried the same line over and over and over again during the last campaign to the point where he was like begging them, suburban women, will you please vote for me? And this, he's still doing it. He's still doing it now. Talk about suburban women. They're going to love me so much. They're going to say, oh, I wish we had that guy back. I wish we had that guy back, that guy back. You know, I mean, again, it, while I watch that person up there, it's tr it, it's true. I, I don't want to say he's ill because I don't want him to get away with even claiming. Right, I think that gives him a in any of the cases. Yeah. But like that is some, like that's some serious serious stuff. But look, the more we share, the more we talk about it. One of the things I am seeing though is that other people are starting to cover this. And that's why relentlessly every single day, I'm not going to normalize that behavior. Like we're going to talk a little bit about the economy. We're going to talk a little bit about NATO. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, some other topics. Very right. But, you know, uh, there was someone I saw in one of the comments on YouTube. They were like, you talk about Trump too much. Right. And a uh, fair point. But then one of the replies to that is like, that's kind of like saying that you've got like Godzilla breathing fire ready to just destroy <laughs> everything. And you want to talk about, well, on the one hand, you got Godzilla. And on the other hand, you know, you got Clark Kent. I don't really see the distinctions here. You know what I mean? It's, you know, and it's like, <laughs> how could you not cover something that is such an impending disaster that you need to call out with the clarity that, you know, to meet the current moment. And that's what we do here at the Midas Touch Network. Just some quick updates on the corpse uh, updates. We did talk about Trump filing the bond, uh, filing a bond list, I should say, a uh, notice of appeal in the New York Attorney General civil fraud case. He did not post the $464 million bond. That means that interest accumulates every single day at about $111,000 each and every day. By the way, Brett, don't we have trumpdebtcounter.com? Yeah, it's trumpdebtcounter.com. It is a live running tally that is monitored by an accountant for accuracy. The accountant, by the way, identifies as a Republican. This is a bipartisan effort here, the Trump debt counter. And I got to give a shout out to Johnny Pomadessa, who is responsible for putting together this live Trump debt counter. Go there right now, trumpdebtcounter.com, and you could see it for yourself. So as I mentioned, Trump can technically still pursue an appeal without posting the bond. However, he can't stay or stop the, and there it is right there. He can't stay or stop enforcement procedures by New York Attorney General Letitia James, which would commence 30 days after judgment was entered on February 22nd. So basically, if he's not going to post the bond, New York Attorney General Letitia James can seize his buildings, sell it, seize his bank accounts. Remember, there's an independent monitor still in place. So the reason that you don't normally file a notice of appeal without the bond is it somewhat makes the appeal moot in a way if the other side's able to enforce their judgment and get their money by the time you're done with the appeal you've lost the judgment that you're appealing anyway but then again you have Alina Habba and Cliff Robert at the helm right here so I don't expect anything less and but again Alina Habba claimed that money was that Trump had it and he would post the bond with the notice of appeal not so, at least as of this uh, episode of the Midas Touch podcast. Also, in the E. Jean Carroll case, Donald Trump tried to also uh, stay the enforcement of the judgment there. Um, and, and in that case, you know, it's coming pretty close. I think by March 7th or 8th, um, you're going to have E. Jean Carroll and her lawyers being able to enforce the $83.3 million judgment there. Uh, Donald Trump is asking the judge, Kaplan, who he attacked over and over again, um, to stay the enforcement of 
of the judgment on an unsecured basis. I'm not sure attacking the judge is a good way to then basically ask the judge to exercise equitable leniency. Um, Worked out so well for him so far. So Judge Kaplan <laughs> responded and said, I don't really see why I would do that, but why don't we set up a briefing schedule? And so the briefing schedule, I mean, it's such a brilliant move and the judge is kind of just playing and toying with Trump. Like if you know what's going on here, it's some, it's actually some funny, funny ways to kind of jab Donald Trump. So E. Jean Carroll's lawyers have until February 29th to respond about whether or not they think that there should be a stay on the enforcement of the $83.3 million number. And obviously they're going to say no. And they're also going to cite the $464 million bond that Trump hasn't posted yet in the New York attorney general civil fraud case. So then the, so then the judge gave Trump until the end of the weekend, basically um, until March 2nd, I think it was to file a reply brief. But then if the judge denies it, say on the third or the fourth, that basically gives Donald Trump two days to scramble and to try to file some like emergency thing. And so, and so the judge really has kind of played with him and toyed with him to like, you know, the judge is going to deny it, but he's going to probably deny it like the Monday, maybe the Sunday or the Monday. And then Trump's going to have two days to try to come up with $83.3 million or E. Jean Carroll's going to enforce that. And then one other legal update to point out as well, the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg filed a number of pretrial motions earlier in the day, one requesting uh, restrictions on the disclosure of jurors' names outside of the parties and their counsel. So Trump's lawyers and the Manhattan DA will know the names of these jurors. And, and really, the Manhattan DA wants to know the name of these jurors because you want to avoid like a runaway juror or like a, a rogue juror here. So you really want to do the social media posts. So that's why I think Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg does not want it to be a totally anonymous jury. You, you want to do the searches, especially here, to make sure none of the jurors are hiding if they're MAGA or not. Um, but it won't get disseminated more broadly than that. And in advance of trial, Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan DA's office, is requesting a limited gag order to prevent Donald Trump from threatening witnesses on topics related to the criminal case. And so, you know, I think that would cover where Donald Trump continues to call Stormy Daniels horse face and no affair and where Donald Trump engages in this witness intimidation. Now, there's a whole body of case law in this motion of all of the other courts from the New York Attorney General civil fraud case to the DC case, um, where you have these limited gag orders in place that have been upheld because of Donald Trump's unhinged and threatening conduct and behavior. So some big updates there. When we come back, I want to talk about the economy. I want to talk about um, MAGA Republicans still going all in on their Biden impeachment inquiry and their Hunter Biden obsession, even though they're relying on literal foreign agents, uh, spies of Russia, foreign agents of Russia to try to take down the United States president. I mean, some real horrific stuff. I mean, they did it with a spy of China. They used the spy of Russia now. <laughs> like that's like they, they are literally aiding and abetting foreign disinfo to try to harm our country. Let's talk about all of that. Some big news on the NATO front to report as well. We've got a lot more show. Let's take our last quick break. Hey, Midas Mighty. So a little while ago, we had the idea that we wanted to sell the best pro-democracy merchandise in the game for the Midas Touch Network. And candidly, we had no idea where to even get started. That's why I'm so glad that we found Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million order stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever, whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms and sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. We use Shopify at store.my 
MidasTouch.com, and it has completely revolutionized our business. It allows us to easily manage our shop, view analytics, provide the best customer service, and streamline our entire online shopping experience from A to Z. We wouldn't be able to bring you all the products you know and love without Shopify, and we can't speak highly enough about it. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S., and Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds and Rothy's and Brooklinen and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way, like they were there for us here on the Midas Touch Network. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify, and we can attest to that. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash Midas all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash Midas to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash Midas. Welcome Let's go. back. Let's Welcome go. back. Thank you to our pro democracy sponsors. And again, the discount codes and the links to our pro democracy sponsors are in the descriptions below. And thank you to all of our new patrons. We're grateful for you, and thanks for everyone who just shares this channel as well. If you want to become a Patreon, help us pass that 15,000 mark and keep soaring to 20,000, just go to patreon.com slash Midas Touch. And for everyone who bought those uh, memberships here on the YouTube, that's separate from Patreon, but thank you for gifting those emojis and all of that. So, Brett, let's talk about some big news foreign policy-wise. Then let's talk about some big news with the economy. Then maybe take it home with what's going on with these do-nothing MAGA Republicans who, while on vacation, want to gaslight and they want to kill the border bill and then you know gaslight about the border. They want to stop Ukraine funding and then somehow blame President Biden for not funding Ukraine. It's over. It's 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 a cycle with these MAGA Republicans. I think the American people are getting it right now. Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen that in the previous uh, special election in New York, that the American people are seeing that the inaction in Congress is not a both sides issue, that there is currently a party that is stepping up and is trying to actually get things done. And there's another party out there in the Republicans that is just trying to obstruct in order to try to help Donald Trump. But nevertheless, despite their best efforts, the economy, well, let, let me first hit this. Despite Trump and Putin's best efforts to destroy NATO, NATO is stronger than ever. And that's thanks to President Biden bringing together this international coalition in the wake of the invasion of Ukraine. The final hurdle on Monday was cleared for Sweden to join NATO after two years of negotiations after Hungary's parliament voted to approve their admission to NATO. A huge blow here to Vladimir Putin and, dare I say, Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans, and a huge diplomatic and foreign policy win for President Biden. Also, despite the Republicans' best efforts to completely blow up the entire economy, and you could be sure that they are still trying, there is some big economic news that we have to report. I'm excited to deliver it to you. And so let's speak about that as part of our NetSuite Know Your Numbers Minute. This is the NetSuite by Oracle Know Your Numbers Minute. So big news on the economic front, everybody. The Dow last week hitting over 39,000 for the first time ever. The S&P 500 over 5,000 for the first time ever. It feels like just yesterday we were saying this record of the Dow crossing 38,000. And just a little bit later, we are already past 39,000 right there. We're seeing a lot of positivity in the comments. We're seeing people spending more money in the economy. We're seeing businesses spending more money in this economy. And I just want to show you a few of these headlines from honestly just the last few days. I'll give a hat tip to CNBC's Carl Quintanilla, who posted some of these on social media. And as you go through, you see headlines from the AP like, what recession? Professional forecasters raise expectations for the U.S. economy in 2024. You see the economic power of consumers here in this headline by the AP. Consumers are increasingly pushing back 
against price increases and winning as we see inflation continue to come down. You see in Barron's, their headline, what if the economy is actually getting stronger? We look towards natural gas, gas prices, natural gas. This is from the Wall Street Journal of all places. Natural gas has not been this cheap in decades. We are seeing these patterns across the economy. And by the way, like you could track all these trends actually with NetSuite's KPI checklist. It gives you the real-time ability to track all of these trends. And you get these customizable dash dashboards where you can monitor specific economic indicators that may impact your business. That's why it's so incredibly useful. And when you look at this year, it looks to be a much better year for the U.S. economies than anybody was even forecasting. It's like we keep hearing this time and time again where they set the expectations low. You hear all this doom and gloom, and then the data starts coming in, mm -hmm. and the data is good. The economy looks like it's set to grow at 2.2% this year after ingesting for inflation. That's according to the National Association for Business Economics. That's up from the 1.3% that economists from universities, businesses, and investment firms predicted in the association's prior survey, which was conducted in November. We got a quote here from Ellen Zentner. She's the chief U.S. economist at Morgan Stanley and president of the NAB. She said a wide range of factors is behind the recent upgrade to the 2024 economic status, including, as I said earlier, spending by both government and households. Economists also more than doubled their estimates for the numbers of jobs that they expect to be gained in the U.S. economy wow. this year. So a lot of positive news. And this is something that we had seen kind of developing at the end of 2023. We were saying this looks like it's coming. This looks like the new narrative that will take hold. And people are finally starting to feel this. And that's why I think it's important, you know, every episode that we highlight things like this. And I want to give a shout out to NetSuite for sponsoring the segment and allowing us to do that it. That was the NetSuite by Oracle Know Your Numbers Minute. Do you know your own numbers for your business? Download NetSuite's ultimate KPI checklist right now at netsuite.com slash Midas. And real quick, I love that segment, y'all. So if you're a fan of the Nets, we know your numbers a minute, please let us know. Drop the comments in. Let them know that y'all enjoyed that segment. They 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 bring us that segment of, of, of the Nets, we know your numbers. I love that. That's my favorite. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Brett, so tell us also what's going on. And there, by the way, you see on the lower third right there, do you... Do you know your own numbers for your business? Download NetSuite's ultimate KPI checklist right now at netsuite.com slash Midas. Check that out. Hey, Brett, what's going on with these MAGA Republicans? Are they back from vacation? Are they still vacationing? Are they hanging out with Donald Trump still at Mar-a-Lago? Because that's what they did two weeks ago. They went on vacation. They killed the bus. So they killed the bus. I want to make sure I have this all right. So you have the toughest bipartisan border deal in history that President Biden says I'm ready to sign this. And in fact, President Biden's like, you know what? Let's pick the person who is, you know, the, the Republican who's in the Senate, uh, James Lankford from Oklahoma, who has basically been like the leading voice on the things that he says, all of the conservative wish lists on, um, on what they want on the border. So James Langford, you know, negotiates these things. Democrats work with him to make sure that these things could be done humanely. The Border Patrol comes out, the Border Patrol Union. They're like, we support this. We like this. And then Donald Trump literally, quite literally says, I want to run on the chaos at the border, so don't fix it. MAGA Mike, make sure you kill the bill. And then Donald Trump went out and brags, I'm telling MAGA Mike to kill it. Then MAGA Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, kills the border deal, and then they do that. Then they kill the Ukraine funding in the House of Representatives, and then Avdivka falls to Russia as, as Ukraine's not getting the supplies that it needs because the MAGA Republicans are doing what Donald Trump is telling them to do, which is do not fund our ally in Ukraine to cause catastrophe there. Then they go and take a vacation, and then... We're like days away from a government shutdown. And now while they're on vacation, they being the MAGA Republicans, everyone's like, what's, we're just going to shut down the government right now? You heard all that great economic news. And Brett, it seems like their whole plan here is again, at the border, international, 
with the economy to quite literally cause harm and then rely on the media not reporting it accurately and both sides in it to be like, you see all of this chaos? It's Biden's fault. Biden did it. And meanwhile, you just literally surgically look at all of these issues and Trump's telling him to kill it. And again, this isn't like, oh, well, you're an anti-Trump guy, so you're going to say things that this he Trump's telling him he's saying it out loud. And they're saying that that's why they're doing it. Mitch McConnell said, look, it's a political thing. That's why we're not doing these bills anymore. So, Brett, give us the give us the latest on what's going on here. Yeah, I mean, you're seeing it time and time again with literally every issue. So they've already abdicated all responsibility on all of these various issues. So what are they doing instead of actually trying to help the American people? They're trying to double and triple down on this failed Hunter Biden probe. They have nothing. They've never had nothing. It's all a scam. And the thing is, this was their big moment for the 2024 election. They were going to try to exploit this moment to try to harm President Biden. And this whole thing came crumbling down. This entire house of cards came crumbling down way earlier than they intended. They're hoping to ride this out to November, have this be like an October surprise, keep throwing stuff at it. But it just continues to be a disaster. So today you had Alexander Smirnoff. This is their Kremlin-aligned asset, the, the Kremlin asset, who's working with Kremlin, the Russian intelligence in order to pedalize, he's admitted this, to pedalize about President Biden, about Hunter Biden, in order to try to take down an American president. This is who the Republicans are working with. And Smirnoff today was denied his bid for pretrial release and was remanded back to jail. And the craziest thing about this is this is not even the first GOP quote unquote witness to be arrested or to be involved as a foreign agent or a spy. If you go down the list, you look at Gal Luft. He was a fugitive Chinese spy and arms trafficker. He was one of the people who the Republicans tried to put out there. You had Devin Archer, who actually exonerated President Biden and Hunter, but they brought Devin Archer out. You got Alexander Smirnoff, and now they have a new star witness. A new star witness is this guy, Jason Galanis, who is currently serving a 14-year sentence for two different schemes. He's in jail for 14 years. This is now who the Republicans have decided, you know what? Let's see what this guy has to say. All of our other people, you know, they, they, they're indicted. So maybe we'll try another person who was indicted on, on crimes. It's just absolutely ridiculous. They're bringing in Hunter again this week to testify on Capitol Hill. It's like they're, they're so desperate to keep this a story. And of course, what do they do anytime they're called out on this stuff? They go, oh, it's just the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax. Russia, Russia. Yeah, because you're working with Russian agents. You are working with agents of the Russian government. It's not a hoax. Well, stop saying Russia when you stop working in Putin's interest, when you stop working with actual Kremlin intelligence agents. How about that? And Republicans just continue to be on the wrong side of all of these issues. We've been seeing the fallout in Alabama after the Alabama Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos are children, which led to hospitals across the state stopping their IVF procedures. And the first day, Republicans did not even know how to react because they have been against these procedures for a long time. But then they saw the polling and the polling was devastating. Kellyanne Conway showed them the polling that 86% of Americans support IVF. And if you're pro-life, one would assume that you would be pro-IVF, right? But no, Republicans are not. And so you saw Republicans quickly, once they saw this data, try to reverse their whole position. You had Trump try to come out as this, as if he was some savior of IVF. Like The reason why the Alabama Supreme Court was able to make this decision, in fact, it was cited in the decision something like 16 times, was because of the ending of Roe v. Wade, which was caused by Donald Trump and these Republicans. And when you look at these efforts of Republicans throughout the years, there is currently, right now, a bill that 125 Republicans have co-sponsored that would ban IVF. And you had all of these politicians coming out and trying to be like, as long as I have a say, IVF will be protected forever. And they kept getting fact check online like, um, excuse me, uh, Nancy Mace, 
Aren't you a co-sponsor of the bill to ban IVF? Uh, excuse me, Byron Donalds. Aren't you a co-sponsor of the bill that would ban IVF? And, you know, I saw a tweet that really summed this up. It was from Ben Wexler, who is a TV writer. And he wrote, I'm kind of pissed that U.S. politics works like this. Voters like IVF. Republicans try to ban IVF. Democrats write bills to protect IVF. Republicans block those bills. Voters learn IVF might get banned. Republicans switch their position. Where for IVF? The media goes, party sp parties spar over IVF. And then the voters are left with the feeling like, oh, I guess both parties suck. And that's what we see in far too many of these situations. But the blame falls on the Republicans who keep pushing these bills that would ban IVF across the country. And if Republicans had their way and had the votes and brought this bill to the floor, they would ban IVF, they would ban abortion, they would ban birth control throughout the entire nation. And Democrats, after the Dobbs decision, saw this coming. Like It was entirely predictable because the language is there. And the Democrats put forward a bill. They encouraged the Republicans. They said, let's pass a bill that at minimum, at minimum, let's carve out access for IVF. Could we agree on that, Republicans? And the Republicans blocked it. And not two years later now are we in the situation here where IVF is being completely eliminated from states and Republicans have their eyes on eliminating it from the entire nation. It's not a both sides issue, folks. This is coming from one side and it's coming from the Republican side. They blow everything up, then they try to blame the other side, just like they do with the border as well. And by the way, I should mention too, President Biden is making a trip to the U.S.-Mexico border. He's going to Texas on Thursday, where he's expected to meet with the U.S. Border Patrol agents, law enforcement, local leaders in Brownsville. He's going to discuss the need for a broader bo a border agreement, and he's going to try to light a fire under these Republicans and say, pass the damn bill. We have a bill. We have a bill that's endorsed by the right-wing Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. We have a bill that's endorsed by the Border Patrol themselves. What are we doing here? If you're serious about this issue, I don't want to hear you just whining every day, trying to use it as a campaign issue, calling it a crisis while you flee, while you literally go on a two-week vacation. Oh, it's a crisis. It's a crisis. I got to go on a two-week vacation, actually. We'll see. <laughs> I got to go to Mar-a-Lago to hang with Donald Trump. Oh, I thought you said it was a crisis. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Nah, it's the time and time again what we're seeing from these Republicans. You know, two final points I want to make. Number one, Brett, you made this point as well. But, you know, look, the Republican judges who they've elevated have backgrounds that would ban IVF. Then the judges do what they said they were going to do in prior rulings and writings. That's why they were brought there by the Republicans. Republicans signed their names to legislation like H.R. 1011, the Life at Conception Act, which would ban IVF. Someone like Nancy Mace, she, she, she co-sponsored it, the Life at Conception Act, which bans IVF. And then she goes, I'll stop at any and all efforts to ban IVF. You're the leader of banning IVF. You're the, that's what a co-sponsor is. But then what these Republicans do is they rely on uh, people's not understanding the way civics are or that the media is going to explain this stuff and, and, and break it down and call them out. So they then say the exact opposite of what they previously did. And they hope that nobody will hold them accountable. You know, and one of the things though, too, just to tie in this whole episode together is, but then Donald Trump goes out there because of his malignant narcissism and pathology. He then goes out there and just says it. Uh -huh, look what we look what I did. I'm the reason for this. I'm the reason for that. Look what I did. I killed the border bill. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, and his instincts throughout his life again were not of the builder they've always been of the destroyer they're not the winner they've always been the loser his instincts are absolutely the worst and his political instincts are nothing short of catastrophic for us here in the united states and abroad but he actually could have got a political win out of the border deal, right? He could have been like, look, 
I'm the one who made this an issue. Look what I was able to achieve even when I'm not in office. Look what I was able to accomplish. And, and imagine what I could do in office, right? I, I, I wouldn't want, you know, I, I'd be like, you know, that's a screwed up way of doing it. You're still the arsonist who created the problem and now you're trying to fix the problem. But the media was going to give him that, that, that gimme right there. They were going to give him the mulligan. They were going to let him do it. But his instinct was to brag about killing it and undermining their one issue that they've had. And it's not because because and it's not just a political issue. This is this is real stuff. Politics is serious business. And what I like about President Biden, while I may not agree on everything with them, I may not agree on everything. But what I like is that there are at least serious people who are trying to address the serious problem. That's how I reflect on this pro-democracy community that's reflective of Democrats, independents, mainstream Republicans who are not MAGA, right? Actual conservatives, you know, liberals, progressives, you know, all, all of us can join together under the banner of democracy. We love our constitution. We love our democracy. We care about normalcy. We care about competence. And when we see this MAGA cult, it's revolting. It's revolting. It's like, what the heck is, what? What? And let's just continue to grow together. Let's continue to expand this community. The best way to do that is share our YouTube channel. Make sure you hit subscribe. We're on our way to about uh, 3 million subscribers. Let's get there together. Uh, make sure you subscribe on audio, not just on YouTube. Audio listeners, subscribe on YouTube. If you can support our pro-democracy sponsors who were super grateful for everything that they do. Um, thank you for everybody who's gifted emojis. And check us out at Patreon, patreon.com slash Midas Touch. Check it out right now. We're going to be doing an after show after the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you so much for watching. A lot going on. A lot going on. I'm confident right now. I know democracy is going to prevail, but let's keep on. Now's the time we work. Now's the time we work hard. Jordy, take it away. Shout out to the Midas Mighty. The Midas Mighty standing strong. Against the fascists, we sing our song. At Midas Touch, we are unapologetically pro-democracy, and we demand justice and accountability. That's why we're spreading our message to Convict 45. That's right, gear up right now with your Convict 45 tees and pins at store.midastouch.com. That's store.midastouch.com.